The book is the South Bend Blue Sox, a history of all American girls professional baseball league team and its players, 1943-1954. And of course, who saw the movie, The uh, League of Their Own? Great film, and it really deals with, in a dramatic way, the kind of uh, moxie that these young ladies had and how they were able to essentially not give us a watered down version of the game, but really uh, cutting edge, excellent professional baseball. And it's, uh, it's going to be fun listening to it uh, as they discuss this. So uh, a few months ago, we were supposed to do this in March, and I'd be remiss if I didn't <laughs> say uh, that we had to have a delay of game. <laughs> and, and our two Actually, it was players, a rain out. <laughs> well, our, our two star players uh, spent some time on injured reserve. Yeah, that's, right. uh, that's good, yeah. Uh, but they're back tonight, and uh, we've pulled the tarpaulins back, and the umpire has looked at me and basically signaled, and they're gentlemen ready to go. And so I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, let's play ball. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, as Alan said, I taught here for a long time, American history from 1977 until I really retired in 2010. I've been kind of working on books the last three or four years. Actually, I became division chair in 94, but I had a knee replaced in the year 2004, and I actually didn't go back in the classroom after that because I like to stand up. Uh, and I hired somebody to uh, take my place and I didn't want to get rid of that person after one year because he was doing a good job so uh, I just spent more time doing research and writing. Um, Bob and I uh, both know this lady Jean Fout that we're talking about and I'll give you a little background here uh, that we met several years ago but the time we first talked about the book Bob came up in the summer of uh, 77, one of these ladies had then passed away, had a niece, her name was Lib uh, Mayen that passed away, but she had a niece uh, that lives out in Fincastle. Well, she had a collection of pictures. And uh, Bob was interested in acquiring those and are now part of the uh, archives of Winthrop University. And at that time, we were talking about doing a biography of Jean Fow because she was one of only two two-time players of the year in the, in the league. Anybody that's a league MVP in any league is good. Uh, that's just all there is to it. So the more we talked about it, uh, the more we decided that rather than do just bio, we do a bio of the whole team. Because that way, because the subject is not that well known, we could bring in more of the women and tell more of their stories and uh, you know that sort of thing. So what started out as the idea of a biography turned into uh, team history. and that's. And, uh, I wrote the first drafts, Bob revised those, you know, we go back and forth and revise things. He, uh, he's uh, the reference library and head of that department in Winthrop, as Alan said, and he photocopied all of the South Bend stories from the South Bend uh, Tribune about this team from 1933 to 44. There ought to be some money in that somewhere because <laughs> I couldn't do it. Uh, I could, but it would have taken me forever. I and mean, we, we both, I think, brought a lot to it. I interviewed most of the people. Uh, uh, Bob did uh, more of the research in the newspapers than I did. We shared ideas. I don't know how many times we've been on the phone, two, three hundred. I have no idea. It was really fun. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed it, and we're friends. And uh, he and his wife, Jane, Jane's back. My wife, Betty, is back here, and Jane is back here, though. They've heard so much about all the American girls things, probably any women in America. So that's the background. Uh, this is the logo they uh, used to wear, and you'll see it, if you look, you'll see it on the, uh, it'll be like on the, uh, you know, on the shoulder. All-American Girls Professional uh, Baseball League. The name changed over the years. Uh, we, have you ever heard people say that uh, the hardest thing to do is start writing something? Uh, you know, I thought about this for a long time. That's the first, uh, that's the first sentence. Uh, you, you know, you got to kind of lead into it. My sister-in-law gave me a bright idea. She said, why don't you pick about three players uh, and mention them right in the first paragraph as a kind of lead into what went on. Well, one of them was going to be Gene anyhow. So what we did was we picked three players, and I know these, these ladies real well. I've interviewed them a whole bunch of times. One is Jean, she started in 46, see the league started in 43. Well, Betsy Jockham, 
whom uh, we know started in 43 and played to 48. So I took her and Jean and another lady named Sue Kidd that started in 49. Their years overlap, but so kind of each one sort of uh, highlights a different part of uh, what's going on. Now they started out playing softball uh, with baseball rules. Uh, you probably know what a uh, softball looks like. I was looking around home to see if I had one, but you know they're big and uh, if you don't know this, the smaller the ball, the harder you can hit it. Uh, you can hit a golf ball a lot further than a baseball, for example, unless you're Babe Ruth maybe. Uh, and a lot of you have indicated that you've seen the movie League of Their Own. Well, that, see that movie is a composite. It's good. It's still really good. It was made 20 years ago this year. But they didn't pitch overhand until 1948. If the movie had shown them pitching underhand, the viewer would have immediately said softball. See? Uh, well, they went overhand, as I said, in 1948, which is the sixth season. By the middle of 54, they'd gone from this 12-inch ball uh, to a, a regulation, uh, you know, 9-inch baseball. Uh, they make replicas of these things. Bob's got an 11-inch ball, which I'll dig out in a minute. I'm going to go a little uh, further here. This is a picture of the... Uh, of the balls. Uh, this would be the regulation ball. Uh, you see here, we, the first two years it was 12, then 11 and a half inches. They went down by increments, uh, 11 inches and 46 and 47, 10 and 3 eighths for a while. Halfway through the 49 season, they went to a 10 inch ball. It's a little bigger than a baseball. Uh, so that this league was always unique. It's, it, it's historic, it's unique. Uh, and these women were good. These women were good ball players. Uh, were they, could any of them played in the major leagues? Probably most of them were playing at the AAA level if you compare it to men's baseball at the time. Uh, probably, probably men could, uh, maybe some would run faster, maybe some could hit harder. None of that matters. All that matters is you're playing people at the level of competition where you're playing. They were at the highest level. So anyhow, as the ball decreased in size, what, the reason for that was when you made it so you could hit it harder, they backed the pitching mound up and they lengthened the base pass. Does that make sense? You can't stay on that original because originally uh, they were doing 65 foot base pass. See, softball is 30, softball is 60 foot from home to each base. They started at 65 feet. Baseball is 90 feet if you don't know that. Uh, so that, for example, in 1948, it was a 50 foot pitching distance, uh, they always used nine players. They always were able to lead off and steal, so it was always faster than softball. Softball's a pitcher's game. Anyone that's ever played good fast pitch softball knows that. Uh, the movie, by the way, is worth saying, there were no actual players portrayed in the movie. Uh, people always ask that question. They were all composites, you know. Uh, I've interviewed uh, several of the women that, uh, I'll go, <laughs> I got another book finished since then. This was, see, we had this accident, so we're kind of, we're, we're six months behind time here. Got an auto accident on the way over. So, uh, since we did this book, which came out in November of last year, I've also completed one in which I interviewed 42 different women in this league. And I just found out today the title's going to be We Were the All American Girls. Uh, so that's coming out. But now I'm working on one about Detroit Tigers in 1956 Major League season. There's no point in sitting around just because you retired, you know. Uh, the movie does show you, though, that they were, you know, these were, they wanted, the phrase of the day was they wanted girls to look, they wanted women to look like girls, but played ball like men. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what they got. That's, a, you know, one of the posters uh, uh, from the movie. And Hanks, uh, who, plays kind of a dipstick character in my opinion. Uh, I've had, I bet I've had a dozen women told me that if he came into our locker room like they showed in the movie, somebody would have hit him over the head with a bat. You know, it shows him drunk and he goes in the, you know, the washroom and all this sort of thing. Uh, this, I, I like this picture pretty well. Uh, this is Betsy Jockham on the left. This lady has since passed away. I interviewed her in 2007 and she's in the book. Uh, we interviewed her too, Betty and I were up there at South Bend. Lou Arnold was her name. You see these two here? They're cardboard cutouts. And you see there's some other ones sitting up there. If you watch that movie and stop it on a DVD, you can see in different scenes they, to add some extra fans who are real cheap. I mean, you don't have to pay these people much to be extras, right? 
I just thought that was a kind of an interesting little take on the movie. Uh, when they made the movie, a bunch of the women uh, were in it. And this, this was taken in the fall of 1991 at Cooperstown. See, at the end of the movie, they show in kind of an alumni game. It's, it's real women that played in the league. Uh, they're pitching and catching and, and uh, all of that sort of stuff. And they're, uh, they're, they're posed here in the fall of 1991 uh, up at Cooperstown. The credits are running right at the end. I've gone back and looked at it. It's kind of fun to go back and look at it. I can't imagine sliding in a skirt. And, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, well, that's rough. Uh, so anyhow, the, the league starts in 1943. It was, the idea was to create an alternative because of the manpower drain. Uh, and there was some actual fear by major league owners that ballparks would be sitting empty by 43. Well, that didn't happen. Phil Rigney, that owned the Cubs, uh, was behind it. Uh, they wanted to, uh, you know, create a fan, keep the fan base going in the Midwest. So they came up with this idea. See, there's thousands. I don't even remember how many thousands. There are thousands of leagues of women playing fast pitch softball. That's why you start out with a game that's kind of like softball, but with baseball rules, and you gradually move into baseball. Because otherwise, where are you going to get women to play baseball? They're, they don't play except in the yard, you know, with their brothers and stuff like that. There's no such thing as an organized league for women to play baseball. That's the, uh, the league emblem that they used for several years, the All-American Girls Baseball League. Notice that the name changes over the years. That's a program, Betcha gave me that. Uh, it, at first it was softball league, and then it was baseball, two words, and it was baseball and uh, all this sort of stuff. Uh, you can see she was pitching underhand. They p pitched underhand at first. This was the first uh, Blue Sox team. Uh, whoops. Oh, I see Betsy. She's ba uh, back here on the right. If I looked at this for a while, I could probably name off most of these girls. But uh, that's a, they took glamour pictures in the first few years to promote it. You know, you always have to have publicity and promote stuff. And uh, she was a pretty girl, a real good. Uh, she signed that picture to myself and Betty. That's a, <clears throat> another picture of her. And that shows you the kind of uniforms they were. See the skirts, if you look, if you look at the skirts in 43, they're just above the knees. Well, the longer they played, the shorter they got. <laughs> because you can't run very fast, you know, skirt that's long, you know, they'd be, they'd be hemming them up and stuff like this. So it's, uh, they were, that's Betsy there. I think we had that, we were up visiting her. She lives and still lives in South Bend. Uh, it's from Cincinnati originally, but we're on a vacation going to uh, Michigan in the summer of 2009. So there were four teams the first year, and in the movie it shows the Rockford Peaches and the Racine Bells. Uh, some people call it racing. I'm not exactly sure which. The South Bend is mentioned, but I don't know that the movie ever did mention Kenosha. See, these are all towns that are close to Chicago. Wrigley was in Chicago, you know. Uh, that was the logo that they wore on their uniforms. There's kind of two time periods. There's from 43 to 50, and then from 51 to 54. So the league owned the ball whole thing uh, in the early years, and then the individual owners took it over in 1951. The peak year was 48. They had 10 different teams, and I just uh, put these up here. You know, we, of course, we've, we've covered all this in some detail, as you might get. In the end, there were only five teams left. Uh, they had financial problems. You're in the 50s, you're in the rise of TV. Even Major League Baseball declined from 48 to about uh, 57. The attendance in Major League Baseball uh, from the year 1948 was not surpassed until 1961 when there were two expansion teams, actually. So, you know, there were less and less people going out to the ballpark in the early 50s. And that really hurt uh, the women's teams. Uh, that was a standard thing, you know, they'd announce the players before the war and they play the, they're facing center field, usually flags were in center field, and they're playing the national anthem. It, was a, it starts out as a kind of a uh, patriotic thing. South Bend played at Bendix Field. Have you ever heard of Bendix Breaks? Uh, they made those in South Bend and they had a really, they had a really good uh, softball team and that's why they had the field there. But that. Uh, gives you just a little idea of the field. They had a dress code. Uh, you know, as I said, they wanted girls that looked like girls, but, you know, played ball like guys and so on. 
for a long time uh, in public, they had to wear the skirts and all that sort of stuff. They couldn't wear slacks. Uh, it's kind of a joke, but they put on make uh, makeup. They had even had uh, charm schools the first two years, where you know people were taught eat the right way and walk downstairs the right way. One thing and another. See, a lot of these girls came off the farm. Uh, Sue Kidd uh, said that you know girls took her under their wing, took her out, and they she bought. Uh, she had dresses, it was all she had, and they bought skirts and blouses and showed her how to do her hair and stuff like that. Uh, uh, so, and you, see what you have to remember here is we're talking about the 1940s. I know today, I, you know, I know this is 2012. Uh, and frankly, I'm an old guy myself, you know, I'm retired. Uh, this is where they pay you to do what you want to do instead of what they want you to do, which is, this is good, you know, if you ever get to that point, it's good. Well, in the 40s, People would not have paid to see women who looked mannish, to borrow the phrase of the day. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Uh, because they, wouldn't have, they would have been frowned on socially uh, in society. So that's why the feminine thing was a big deal. And that's why they went to, because uh, see, women that played fast pitch softball usually either wore slacks or shorts. They didn't wear, they didn't, they didn't wear you know, they sliding in uniforms and all that sort of thing. Uh, most of the games are played at night, and the reason for that is lots of people work in the daytime. Where are you going to get your fans if you, you know, you play your games in the daytime? They did play in the daytime on uh, Sunday sometimes and occasionally, but they played at night. These are actual uh, pictures. These are some of the Blue Sox girls in 1944. Betsy's in the middle. Uh, one of the famous, more glamorous players uh, is Bonnie Baker on the left. I can. Uh, Rose Gayshock has got her hand up over her head, Kay Bennett on the right. I, I've been, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, there's Betsy and Bonnie Baker's on the left there. Lib Mayan that I mentioned is second from the right. The other girl, Sugar Kane. Uh, and it, you know, you don't play ball always, even if you're a professional ball player. And by the way, uh, I should say this while I'm thinking about it. Uh, you know, they were paying between the first few years between like about $55 and $85. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like very much. Uh, one thing I always remember was a, um, a lady named Vivian Kellogg started in the year 1944. She was making $37.50 a week for the phone company, and she made $75 a week playing in the league. Well, her dad didn't make $75 a week. <laughs> Nobody, no women were making more than their father unless maybe they were lawyers or something like that. So, you know, it was, for the time period, it was, pr it was pretty good pay. But you gotta have some fun. So anyhow, the war ends, in, you know, in the 46 season. Instead of the patriotic stuff, now it's like uh, support community organizations. They, already si they were already civic-minded. There's Bonnie Baker endorsing, uh, you know, local business. Ball players get paid for this kind of stuff, you know. She got paid uh, what they call under the table, you know, some of the, People that were famous always got uh, paid. There's always backers. Betty and I were watching a, uh, an old movie last night from about 1951 called Saturday's Heroes. It was about a kid that went from high school to college, and he had these, all these backers. They called it Jackson College in Virginia. I think it was really uh, William and Mary, actually. Uh, but that's what they did, you know. They, uh, it was money like that's her. That's uh, she's not alive anymore. I never had the opportunity to talk to her. She was. Uh, Pretty glamorous. Now they started wearing uh, riding buses. See, they rode trains during the war because there was a transportation crisis. You can't buy gasoline. Gasoline was rationed, so they rode trains. And I didn't say this, but there was a, uh, a North Shore elevated that ran out of Chicago up to Milwaukee, and that's why Racine and Kenosha were in the league. And they had a South Shore that ran all the way to South Bend, and then Rockford was in it too. We take the train from Rockford. See, so if you're Going from South Bend to Rockford, you take the South Shore into Chicago, transfer, and you take a 90-mile train ride out to Rockford. And if you're going from Rockford to Racine, you're coming into Chicago and going up the North Shore. Betsy says they really liked riding on the bus because they relaxed the rules. See, but you couldn't get off the bus once they're going on a trip somewhere without wearing a skirt. I mean, you know, they'd make them, yeah, even, even in the middle of the night. I got some funny stories about that in this uh, other book, you know, going out in the cornfield and in the dark, uh, do your duty, you know. Uh, didn't have 
convenience stores on every corner like they do now. That's an actual schedule from uh, 1946. Observe that by 1946, they're called the All-American Girls Baseball League, and they're also now playing at Playland Park. I'll show you a picture of that. It tells where the team's offices were and so on. That's the Blue Sox in 46. That's Jean Fouts' first year. She's sitting in the front row on the right. Betsy's second from the left in the back row. Uh, this is where they played in Playland Park. And a pretty nice aerial view. Now, r racing's always been big in Indiana. You notice there's a, there's a racetrack around here. And see, this was a cinder racetrack, okay? Notice that the diamond sits here. Uh, there's a concrete grandstand. I've been to that. Uh, we, have, we have some pictures of it. I don't have it here. The grandstand is still present. Now there's an apartment complex over here and so on. Let's see if I can see the clubhouse. Uh, here, this is the grandstand. Here's the little clubhouse uh, behind it here. So if you slid into home paint, you, you weren't sliding on dirt. You're sliding on cinders that race cars drove on. A lot of people went in standing up. Uh, that's the concrete grandstand. Betty were, and I were there uh, two summers ago, and I've got some pictures of it. It no longer exists, but it kind of gives you an idea, uh, you know, of the ball, uh, ballparks of, of the era. Now we're into 1947. They stayed at Playland Park. All of, they were one of the two teams that played the whole 12 years. Rockford Peaches were one, and Blue Sox were the others, partly why we picked them. This picture was taken on the roof of the Seville uh, Biltmore in Havana. Uh, they all signed it. Uh, they, went there for, they went to Havana for spring training in 47. The Dodgers had been there before. Newspaper reports, because they had Jackie Robinson, right? Uh, and he, he, Robinson was the first black man who was going to play in the majors. They didn't want to play in Florida. Florida was really segregated uh, in the 1940s. They just figured there'd be some serious problems, so they went to Cuba. When the All-American girls came along, they drew more fans to their games than the Dodgers did. They're real proud of that. Uh, one of the people that's in another one of these books is Doris Sams on the left. I know the other two girls. Uh, Betty and I went down and interviewed her in Knoxville a long time ago in 1997. I was a featured speaker at their reunion. They have reunions every year starting. First one was in 82, but they started making them annual events around 1993 or so. I'll come back to her. 47, see they're still underhand. Hey, Billy. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, they started going sidearm. Well, let's see, they always plan to make it into baseball but they're going by increments. Uh, and there comes your big adjustment for most girls because it's easier to pitch this way than it is that way. Uh, anybody that's ever pitched a baseball can tell you that. She's in my book of 42 interviews. Her name is uh, Hain, uh, Do Do Dottie Hain, uh, not her married name. This is at the All-Stars. Observe that Dora Sams is on one of the All-Stars. There's only a couple of uh, South Bend players in there. They, uh, look how big the gloves are. So you can, you can look at it, and they're using about an 11-inch ball. You can see how big the ball looks in a glove at that time. Uh, that's, that's Doris uh, Sams. She's, she was one of my, uh, she's one of our favorite people to talk to. We got all done and went out to this cafeteria. I forget. Betty knows the story better than I do, but she says, I don't cook, you know, you know, might as well not be a kitchen here, you know. She, when she retired, she worked for the telephone company, or utilities company, I guess it was, in Knoxville for 25 years. She was a, a tr just a tremendous athlete. She was two-time player of the year in uh, 47 and 49. I think she was on the all-star team six times. Gene Fouts, the only other two-time player of the year. I mean, these people were really good. Sammy was her nickname. Anyhow, she says to me, uh, she said, stick with me, buddy. You'll be walking in high cotton. <laughs> <laughs> she was a lot of fun. They had the first Gene Fault night. Uh, teams, a lot of teams on her, good players in the year 1947. I thought that was kind of cool. They brought all these gifts. Bob's going to talk about Gene. Uh, you know, I mentioned her, but, Bob, but uh, Bob's going to tell you, highlight Gene's career. A lady that kept all of her letters she received from those ball players loaned them to me. She had a, had a box that had probably 200 letters where she'd write to them and send them a picture and they'd write back notes and stuff. 
That was uh, somebody's, you know, the league put out that for a Christmas card. I think it was in 1948. That was Lib Mayen that we mentioned. She was from Greenville, South Carolina, a uh, graduate of Winthrop College, and her, uh, all of her materials are in the archives there, and Jean's are in the archives at Winthrop College. So uh, Bob's sitting on a pile of good stuff down there. That would be, uh, they would be in South Bend probably with snow on the ground. So 1948, we go to overhand pitching. They added to, uh, a couple teams that didn't really last. Uh, the, that, that attendance figure is for the whole league. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, they probably, if you were doing well, they used to say that a minor league team that did well drew its population in a year. In other words, if you were a town of 70,000, you could get 70,000 fans in a year, you were gonna, you know, be, uh, be okay. Uh, they trained that year at Opelika, Florida. They trained in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. And during the war, all, all baseball teams trained where they were in the Midwest or the East. But uh, the girls went to uh, <clears throat> Pascagoula in 1946. That's in Mississippi. They were in uh, Havana, Cuba, which I mentioned in 1947. They went to Opelika. And that was the last year the league could afford to send them. Uh, to the south. That's the ball they used in 48. It was 10 and 3 eighths inches. And we have here, Bob brought this along, we have here an 11 inch ball they started to use in the middle of 1949. You can see that it's a little bit bigger than a baseball. It's not a lot, but when you go to that ball, it's about 3 quarters of an inch further. Trust me, you can hit it harder. Uh, you, there is really no question about that. That's signed by the team owner and uh, some of the players. You notice it doesn't have red seams. And they didn't put, uh, the center wasn't the same as a baseball. You know, it had a dead ball sound. We refer to it as a uh, dead ball here. You get cork in the middle of that uh, thing. And in 49, they went to the red seam balls. Cuban girls started playing in 48. There never were any black girls that played in the league. Couple tried out with South Bend. We know in 51's Bob found a picture uh, there's a, one author had mentioned it. Uh, that was just, that was a, you know, we've, we've been back and forth over this. Uh, rather than fight that battle, they were more interested in having fans come out to the ballpark and support the teams. Jean got married. She had her first son, Larry, uh, whom we have met in 1948. I think Larry was born on March the 31st. Can you imagine having a baby and, and pitching baseball two months later? I don't think a man in the world <laughs> could do that. Even if it were possible for men to have children, I doubt if very many guys would be on a ball field uh, pitching two months later. Of course, they were dressed up for a banquet here. I, mean, I think you can see these are good looking women. Guy in the second from the right to manager, it would be Dave Bancroft for South Bend just before the 1949 season. Now, I like this picture uh, because you know, they're holding the bats, and you look at it, Bonnie Baker's on the left standing up, and Jean's uh, uh, next to her, I think. I, again, I could name off a lot of these pictures. I want to show you this. Whoa, there's a cover of our book. Of course, I had to throw that out there, didn't I? Right? Oops, I went, went the wrong way. What I wanted to show you was what I think McFarland did a really nice job uh, putting that picture on the cover of a book. I think, I think the cover, it's a paperback. I think the cover's uh, uh, real attractive. They go nuts over these long subtitles. Uh, we got three of the women, Betsy and Sue and Jean Fouter, right a forward uh, for the book. There's a, there's a lot of publicity. I'm just kind of showing you some you know, images to give you an idea of uh, what's going on. Uh, that would be 1949. That's a picture off of a uh, magazine. Uh, she's hitting the ball, and you can see she's been sliding, because that's why that's why her you know her legs are uh, wrapped up. Now in '49 and '50, the two teams, the Colleens and the Sallies, that were added in '48, both you know lasted the season. The league carried one, and the other one just they went out of business. So they made touring rookie teams out of them. Because where are you going to get your minor league players? See, there's no minor league. Uh, Major League Baseball players almost always go through the uh, minors. So these girls are traveling around playing each other, different places, Yankee Stadium, Griffith Stadium, all over the place. From uh, Texas to New York, and there's a, 
uh, kind of a nice uh, picture. And a lot of these girls that played, Sue Kidd's one of them, she played uh, uh, on, the, on the touring teams. The management corporation that ran the league actually was bought out by the teams. Up until that time, each team paid a fee of several thousand, like seven or eight thousand, plus three cents uh, per ticket was given. I mean, you gotta finance this stuff somehow, you know, this is all private. Uh, we're not really talking very much money. Uh, there's the girls in the year 1950, and the reason we like that 49 picture, because as soon as you see them holding the bat, you know, you know, you're, baseball comes to mind. There's kind of a nice picture of uh, Jean. This, she was a right-handed pitcher. Uh, I won't say much about her, because Bob's going to. Uh, All-stars in the year 1950. Uh, some of those are uh, in my book of interviews. Now in 51, they went to individual teams owning it. Uh, well, okay, uh, they figured they'd save money that way. Well, you got if you don't promote what you've got, if you don't make people aware of what you got, you're not gonna draw fans. So they actually drew fewer fans, and, and the difficulty in the 50s, in Korean War started in the year 1950, by the way, but the difficulty in the 50s is where are you gonna recruit women that are willing to go out and make this commitment and go off and, and you know, do this? And, uh, you don't see this logo very often. Uh, Sue Kidd gave me that. It was the American Girls Baseball League. I don't know why they did the two Bs, but they went from all American to American. They actually just crossed it to indicate that it was no longer run, league run, but individual owners. But the guys that ran these teams were all men. Uh, that's Carl, third from the left, isn't it, Bob? Yeah, Gene's husband, Carl Winch, uh, became, he was uh, around the league for a long time, and then he became, they hired him for manager in, in the year 1951 when the previous manager quit, and therein was a conflict because his wife was the best player on the team, and uh, you know, he was the manager, and, and that a difficult marriage is all I'll say about that. We cover it in the book. Picture of them in 51, they had 16 girls on a team. I think there was more than that there, which indicates a picture was taken before July 1st, which was a cut down to eight. Uh, they won two uh, championships. South Bend won it in 51 and won it in 52. Uh, they, they really came on strong. They divided the season into a first and second half. In 51, they hadn't done that since 1944, but they're already looking for ways to excite fans and get more you know people interested in that. Carl was a manager. She was 15-7. I don't know if you know anything about earned run averages, which is what that is. Uh, but her lifetime earner on average is under two. Uh, there were several guys, uh, umpires and other guys who watched batting practice. How about, I can hit that stuff. How about letting me bat? She said she doesn't, doesn't know how many times she's done it over the years. None of them ever got a hit because the ball is breaking. See, it's not speed in baseball. And she had three curves, the overhand, a three quarters, a sidearm curve. Uh, she had a change up. She had a, she could throw it hard. She had to uh, had the fastball. But if uh, she said, you know, once you get the batter guessing, they're yours. You know, they're not going to hit if they're guessing. That's a cartoon that appeared in the South Bend paper uh, of Gene. I think uh, that was that would have probably been in 1951. They won the championship, and uh, you know, they're all pictured around this car. They're happy. Uh, really pretty cool. In 1952, they they were down to eight teams. Uh, financial losses uh, cut out the franchises at Peoria and Kenosha, as you can see. So we're left with South Bend, Rockford, two of the original teams, Kalamazoo Lassies, Fort Wayne Daisies, Battle Creek Bells. They were actually had moved from Racine. They were the Racine Bells and Grand Rapids Chicks. Uh, and the Blue Sox won it again. Uh, interesting, Bob and I were talking about this tonight. He said that somebody asked him at the reunion, recently if we had stuff in the, there was a six player walkout there was a lot of dissension and they asked him if we covered that in the book <laughs> he said yeah yeah we did <laughs> they all they all kind of uh, knew about it uh, in that game I got to say this I can't help it uh, in that game she pitched she had two triples and the first one knocked in a couple runs if I'm not mistaken in about the third inning and she came up in the uh, it was either the sixth or seventh inning. She had a second triple. She ran, got around third, and she was so exhausted from pitching. And, and when she didn't pitch, she played third base, by the way. Nobody does that. Warren Spahn couldn't do that on the best day of his life. Uh, 
she stopped and came back and sat down in the bag. And this girl, I got it, and we've got it. I originally had an article about her out of the dugout from the other team comes this voice of Rose Gayshock. That girl must be tired. <laughs> she had a home run, but they, you know, they weren't hitting it over the fences. They were, you know, running them out. But they actually won the championship uh, with 12 players, 10 really that played. Pitchers played other positions and stuff. She pitched and won three of the is a best of five series. She pitched and won three out of the five playoff games. Incredible. This is one of my favorite pictures of uh, Jean. She's on the left, accepting the trophy, and their names are all on there. Uh, Mary Froning was the one I was trying to think of. As, uh, yeah, <laughs> we were talking baseball before this. Uh, now they're down to six teams and 53, because as I said, uh, South Bend, they were weak, because there were some good women that uh, quit the team. The manager, what he did was suspended this girl, Shorty Pryor, and five of the others walked off in support of her, and we get into all that sort of thing. Uh, this is Sue Kidd that I mentioned. She's one of the three people we kind of highlighted all the way to. She, she's the only girl in the history of the league that pitched and won two complete games in a doubleheader, two seven-inning games, because in doubleheaders they played seven innings instead of nine. They were playing regular baseball rules. Uh, pitched and won both games in a uh, doubleheader. It was against Grand Rapids, and uh, uh, they had a good bunch of people. These, uh, these, when you talk to these women, they're just remarkable people. Remarkable. It's just, it's just been a lot of fun. That was, a, that was a handout that they gave to fans in 1953 when they came to the ballparks. Actually, five by seven. Look at her record. It was 20 and two, and she won three out of four in the playoffs. Down to five teams in the last year, Battle Creek ran out of money. Uh, the last season, Kalamazoo won the playoff. Jean didn't play in 54. I think she told us she'd go to the, went to the ballpark a couple times, but she cried in the stand. She couldn't stand to not be out there. This is the very last uh, team picture of the Blue Sox. Uh, uh, scorecard in 54, uh, a picture of the All-Star team in 54. Uh, as I said for the book, we interviewed a lot of people at Sioux Kid. Bob got to meet her at a reunion in Syracuse a couple of weeks ago and said, really a neat, neat person. Uh, about 600 women uh, played in the league over the years, and some of them were really top players. That's kind of, I like a picture of Jean. She was here back in 2008. We gave a little presentation like this. There were some, some of my friends here uh, met her at that time. And that was a, Bob made this display at uh, Winthrop Library, and we had, that picture was taken in the year 2009. I like that picture real well. Uh, that was their logo that they used after 1951. And then they, as I said before, they started reunions, and uh, now it's like an annual thing. A lot of them have passed away. I'd say there's probably less than 100 of the 600 still alive. Uh, the 50th year reunion was held in South Bend, uh, the last sentence of the book, that's it. Uh, you know, you can... We tried to do what we could to make these people come alive to the readers and uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, I have actually a greeting card uh, made up that's got the cover of the book on the uh, front. Uh, I've got some cards that, cards that we use to promote it. Uh, up here, if you're interested in information about the book, it's on there. Amazon's got it, of course. Hello, I think we are done. Yeah. Yep. These were truly remarkable women. Um, they were tough, they were independent. You got to think this is in the uh, 1940s, early 50s. And for women to leave home, a lot of them from small towns, to leave their families, in some cases their husbands, their boyfriends, to play baseball, and to go against all the conventions of the time is pretty incredible. Uh, these were truly uh, pioneering women, and I think um, this was all before Title IX, uh, and um, th they're, they're just tremendous. All right, two weeks ago I was in Syracuse for the annual reunion, and it's fun to see them because the past just comes alive. It's like they're still playing the game. They're still the same resentments, the same friendships. I mean, they'll talk about each other. Um, they even they, they had a softball game where a couple of them actually played in the game 
one of them wearing her uniform, both of the women who played both got hits and both ran them out. Now the youngest is like 77, 78 years old, okay? So these are not young women and they are just, they are just lively. Um, Betsy Jockham is what, 92, 93 years old? She was rooming with Jean at the, uh, at the uh, uh, reunion and um, Saturday night they had a banquet. We were leaving Sunday morning. And Jean said, Betsy didn't come in until 1 a.m. She was out drinking. <laughs> so. Now, in some ways, some ways Jean is um, typical of the women who played. In some ways, of course, she was a superstar, so she was untypical in some ways as well. Typical in the sense that she came from a small town. Um, she left her family of origin. Um, she used the experience to expand her horizons. A lot of these women went on to college, uh, became professionals, doctors, lawyers, uh, school teachers. A lib man who went to Winthrop uh, stayed in South Bend and became a, a PE teacher and then later on a guidance counselor. A lot of the women stayed in the towns in which they played uh, after, after their playing days were over with. Uh, so this opened up a lot of possibilities uh, for these young, young women. Now, uh, as Jim mentioned, the game evolved over time from soft, uh, underhand uh, fast pitch softball to uh, toward regulation uh, baseball. Uh, Gene came in during the period 1946 when it was evolving from underhand to sidearm, which was fortunate for her because she never played softball. Okay, uh, she was without a doubt the greatest pitcher in the overhand period of the league and she was the heart and soul of the Blue Sox. Uh, Sue Kidd, I, I talked to Sue Kidd at the uh, reunion and Sue uh, had a presentation at the banquet and she said of Jean that she carried the Blue Sox on her shoulder in that 1952 season which I'll talk a little bit about with the Player Rebellion. Uh, so no question about that. Uh, she was born in 1925 in East Greenville, Pennsylvania. Um, she developed her pitching skills, she says, by spending literally hours throwing rocks at telephone poles. Okay? Uh, she was a high school athlete, but she never played softball. In fact, <laughs> when they were playing this softball game, she was very contemptuous of the fact that they were playing softball. Okay? Uh, she played field hockey, she played basketball, but never softball. Um, in the town, there was a semi-pro team called the Cubs. And she used to go out and shag flies for them, as well as occasionally pitch batting practice. Uh, and there was a player on the team, I think he's the one third front row, third from the left there, second baseman, who taught her how to pitch, taught her how to throw a curveball, how to throw a fastball, how to throw, you know, a, a slider, that sort of thing. Uh, and she gives him a lot of credit for, uh, uh, for, for making her the pitcher that she was. Now, she had never heard of the All-American Girls, okay? But in uh, 1945, the end of 1945, she was contacted by a scout uh, who said, would you like to play professional baseball? And of course, she said, it took her about two seconds to say yes. Fortunately for her, her family was supportive, okay? So at the age of 21, uh, she goes to spring training uh, in 1946 and um, becomes a member of the South Bend Blue Sox. Now, she didn't come in as a pitcher. She came in as a third baseman because at this time, at the beginning of 1946, it was still underhand pitching. But toward the end of the season, they began to go allow a sidearm motion. And so that's when she started pitching. And that very first year, she had 12 starts. She was 8-3 and three with a 1-3-3 ERA. Okay. Uh, the next year, she had 44 starts winning 19 and losing 13. She never had a losing season. She never had an ERA uh, above 1.51. Um, and her winning percentage were always above 600. Uh, she had a good fastball, a sharp breaking curve, great control. She said her left foot when she pitched always landed in, in the same spot. And for pitchers, that's very important because just some slight variation in their motion or where they land it messes up their pitching. Okay, that's when you suddenly see in the major leagues a pitcher who suddenly can't make, throw strikes, that sort of thing. Something has changed in his, his pitching motion. She said a scout even remarked on it once that how, how consistently she pitched and how her left foot always landed in the same spot. Um, she uh, had a strong arm. She never suffered an arm injury. In spite, and sometimes, 
In one year, she pitched a 22-inning game, complete game, and won it one to nothing. Her opponent also pitched those 22 innings. And then a few weeks later, she pitched a 19-inning game and won that one as well. Okay. Now, can you imagine, if you've watched Major League Baseball now, about the fifth inning, they're looking toward the dugout. Okay, I've done my five innings, take me out. These women would have died before they would be taken out of a game. Uh, Dottie Kamenchek uh, was probably the league's greatest hitter. In fact, she was uh, scouted, it may have been a publicity thing, but by a minor league team. And Commissioner Landis at the time stepped in and said, no, 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 no women in the minor league. So we don't know what would have happened, whether that was publicity stunt or not. Uh, but she thought that Jean was one of the two greatest pitchers that she faced in her illustrious career. She said she uh, did not have any weaknesses. You only hoped that she would be a little wild, which she rarely, rarely was. Now, what did she accomplish in her career? She was player of the year twice, 1951 and 1953. As, as Jim mentioned, <laughs> only one other player was player of the year twice. She missed being player of the year in 52 by a single vote. Okay. She led the ER, uh, e league in ERA in 1950, 52, and 53. She led the league in shutouts in 49 with 12. She was an all-star in 1949, 1950, 1951, and 1953. The reason she wasn't an all-star in 52 is that the Blue Sox had won the league championship, and the champion team played against the all-star team, so she pitched against the all-star team uh, that particular year. Jim mentioned she holds the league record for single-season winning percentage, which is a 20-2, and two, an absolutely incredible uh, figure. She's second in uh, career wins, 140. She led, literally led the South Bend Blue Sox to two championships, 51 and 52. And, most remarkable of all, she pitched two perfect games in her career. And I have not found a baseball player, male, female, at any level, that's pitched two perfect games. Now, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but that's, that's an incredible, incredible record. You can see her pitch, pitching record here. She uh, ended up with a career 140 wins in 64 losses. Her ERA, career ERA, was 1.23. What's interesting to me is that she did all this while the game was constantly evolving. Even sometimes in mid-season, they would change the size of the ball, they would change the distance from the, from the pitcher's mound, they would change the base pass. As you can see, when she started in 1946, they were using an 11-inch ball, the bases were 70 feet apart, and the pitching distance was 43 feet. By 1953, her last year, the ball had gone down to 10 inches, was 75 feet, and most remarkable of all, pitching distance was 56 feet. In her career, the pitching distance moved back 13 feet. And I can't think of a single major league pitcher who could have handled that change. Okay? And also, when considering her perfect games, the other thing you have to consider is the playing conditions. Uh, Jim talked about this shot of Playland Park, which was their home park. As you can see, this isn't Yankee Stadium. Okay? Uh, as Jim pointed out, it was a racetrack, cinder block. They would have a little, little layer of dirt on that. Home plate was right on that track, so the sliding was fun. But the field's rough. Uh, the lighting is, is very limited. Uh, and so all those come into play in terms of how it might impact a perfect game. Because a perfect game is nobody reaches base for any reason. No walks, no hits, and no errors. Okay, so a pitcher has to depend on the ability of their teammates behind them uh, to, to uh, protect a perfect game. And uh, there are often games where there are seven or eight or nine errors per game, okay? And a lot of times the field conditions would be part of the reason they were committing errors. Okay, let's look at these two uh, perfect games. 1951, uh, Gene was already a seasoned pitcher. Uh, she'd been to postseason twice. Uh, she was one in three in early round losses in 1948 and 49. And in 1951, uh, she was eight and five the first half of the season. As I think Jim mentioned, the season were divided in two halves. Uh, first half, second half, and then the winners of the halves would play each other in a championship. She was eight and five, but all those five losses were by one run. Okay, her team was not giving her support. So, 
On July 21st, it began the second half of the 1951 season. Uh, that's when she pitches her perfect game. I like what the uh, local paper, South Bend Tribune, said about her afterwards. She, they called her a sturdy gal with a lot of heart who dominated the peaches with a fastball that hops and a curve that breaks off like a country road. Okay? They don't write like that anymore. It wasn't until the fifth inning that she fell behind her first batter when she went 3-0. She struck out that batter on the next three pitches. Only one other time did she go three and two, and, that, and in the ground out, just two, ball, just two balls left the infield, a foul out to right fielder Betty Wagner and a fly to center fielder Nancy Stoll. Um, the Blue Sox scored their two runs because of errors committed by the shortstop for the Peaches. This is where errors come into play. Okay. She struck out five of the last nine batters, including the starting pitcher for the Peaches, uh, Nikki Fox. Now, the Peaches uh, were probably the Yankees of the All-American girls. They were almost always in contention in postseason. Okay? Uh, and as I mentioned, Dottie Kamenchak was the league's greatest hitter. Uh, she was a seven-time All-Star. She won the batting title twice. She was a career leader in hits with 1,090, and in 1951, the year of this game, she led the league with a 3-4-5 batting average. Now, that's incredible because most of the batting averages were around 250 or so, 240. It really was a pitcher's league during this time. Um, Kamenchek only struck out 81 times in her entire career. In the game against Gene, she struck out twice. Okay? I uh, had a chance to uh, have some correspondence with Dottie before she passed away uh, when I was working on an article on Jean's Perfect Games, and she wrote back to me and she said this about Jean. She said, everything was working, curve, fastball, drop, you name it. I tried bunting, no soap, swung at the first pitch, and no soap, worked deep into the count, and no soap. That day she was beautiful to watch. I doubt she felt that way that day. <laughs> Years later she thought that way. I asked Jean, uh, you know, why? How, you know, what was, you know, what was she attributed to? And she said, well, I just had a really good team behind me. That's one of the things you find about these women. They're very humble. They don't walk around bragging about themselves. And I know I've been to two reunions, and both times they'll come up to me and thank me for writing about them, for writing this book as if somehow I've done something, you know, and it's not them. Uh, they're very, very humble. Uh, she still remembers uh, to this day uh, the shoestring catch that Betty Wagner made on a foul ball. Um, you can see her name was Old Reliable. She was a very good fielder. Uh, prior to that game, the Blue Sox were in third place. Afterwards, they went on to finish first uh, in the second half, and they ended up with the league's best record of 75 and 36. Uh, the 1951 championship, the championships were played in two rounds, a best of three and a best of five. Uh, in the first round, she beat the Fort Wayne Daisies two to one. And she won the third contest uh, by two to one as well. Uh, then she uh, co pitched complete games, nine innings in the first and ten in the third. The championship uh, was against the Rockford Peaches. Games, first two games, the, uh, the Blue Sox lose because Gene isn't pitching. Uh, game three, she comes back and pitches and wins three to two, striking out eleven and walking two. Uh, in game four, the Blue Sox win, so we come down to the crucial fifth game for the league championship. Jean doesn't start pitching. She starts at third base. Uh, the Blue Sox were ahead six to nothing at that point uh, when the starting pitcher suddenly gets into trouble. Uh, she's got the bases loaded. There's one out, and there's already two runs in. They bring Jean in from third base. Very first pitch, ground ball back to Jean, double play. The Blue Sox go on to win 10 to 2. It was the first of the, league, of the Blue Sox two league championships, and Gene naturally is named Player of the Year after that particular year. Uh, as Jim mentioned, in 1952, she went 20 and 2 uh, with a 909 winning percentage. She gave up only 19 earned runs in those games for a .93 ERA, and she led all pitchers with 114 strikeouts. Now, the championship that year was against the Rockford Peaches again. Uh, she loses game one. She was uh, uncharacteristically wild uh, and loses game one. The uh, Blue Sox go on and lose game two, but they protest the game because they lose by a home run 
Uh, and it turns out that the Peaches had moved the fence in prior to the game to make it shorter. Uh, they moved it in. Yeah, they moved it into 190 feet, which is 20 feet shorter than the league regulations. And a lot of these fields didn't have fences, um, but ones that did, they had to have them at least 210 feet out. And the league upheld the protest, so they replayed the game, and Gene pitches that game uh, and wins that as well. Uh, and series is tied in game five. Gene goes on and wins that 6-3, pitching all nine innings and hitting two triples, the one Jim mentioned. Uh, the second one, she said that by the time she hit third base, she was so tired, she just sat down on the bag. Now, what's also interesting about this particular event <laughs> is the dissension that was on the team. Jean mentioned uh, the manager in 1951 was Carl Winch, who turns out to be Jean's husband. Jean had no idea he was going to be named manager. But you can imagine what happened on that team when one of the players' husbands is now manager. Suddenly, first of all, she's married, which most of the women are single, so they're living together. She's living separately, so you already got a little bit of isolation going on there. But suddenly, they think, okay, she's got the inside scoop, she's going to be treated better, blah, 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 blah. That was not the case at all. Uh, Carl Winch, I just say, was not a very nice guy, okay? Uh, but she was isolated, and it caused a tremendous amount of dissension. 51, Winch was kind of a player's manager. But 1952, something happened. I don't know whether the management talked to him about some of the women being too independent or whatever. Uh, as Jim mentioned, this was a male-controlled league, and you know they wanted feminine women. They didn't want independent women, and all these women were independent. Uh, so I, I think he must have been given instructions to crack, crack down on him, and it caused a lot of dissension uh, on the team itself. Toward the end of the season, within, what, the last week or so, there's a player's walkout uh, in which six of the players, most of them starters, leave the team, which leaves the team with only 12 players to go into the playoff. So Gene goes into this playoff, first of all, isolated. Um, some of the players are suspicious of her. Uh, and yet she still wins. Uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable in my opinion. Uh, 1953 was going to be Jean's last season. Uh, she basically, I asked her what happened. She said, I was just tired of the dissension. I was just tired with the bitterness, uh, with how I was being treated by some of the players. Uh, and so she'd had it. It was a lousy year for the Blue Sox in 53. They finished second from last with a 45 and 65 record. Well, they had lost a good percentage of their starters the year before and they just weren't able to replace them. As Jim mentioned, toward the end of the league, it was harder and harder to recruit women that had some baseball skills and experience. Uh, and so the team, the rookies, were much weaker than the rookies had been earlier. Um, but she was the only winning pitcher on the, on the team. She had a 17-11 and 11 record, which tied her for first in the league. And her ERA mushroomed to a very high 1.51, okay. On the evening of September 3rd in Kalamazoo, Jean started what would be the second to last game of her career. Uh, they played the Kalamazoo Lassies, and Jim mentioned Doris Sammy Sams, uh, who was also a great superstar player. Uh, Doris started out as a pitcher in the underhand period, uh, but when it went to overhand, she couldn't do that. And this was real typical, what happened in the league. You had all those underhand pitchers, and suddenly they couldn't throw the ball overhand or sidearm, what happened to them? Well, some of them became position players. And some of the position players, like third basemen, who knew how to throw the ball across the field, became pitchers. So you had a conversion. That's what happened to Doris Sam. Doris, interestingly enough, had a perfect game in the underhand period. Uh, she was also, she won the batting crown in 1949 with a 279 two average. Uh, in 1952, uh, she led the league with 12 home runs. They, don't, they didn't hit a lot of home runs until the last half of 1954 when they went to the regulation baseball. Um, and she was only one of two players, Jean being the other, was named player of the year twice. So Jean was facing a good team with a lousy team behind her, basically, is what I'm saying. So what happened? This is a scorecard that somebody put together for her after the game. Um, she struck out eight, only three fly ball outs, one to right and two to center. Uh, the Blue Sox scored four runs in the top of the fifth. Uh, Gene actually drives in the fourth run 
because the pitcher walked her with the bases full. Um, that, uh, she had one more start at the end of her career on September 6th. Uh, they had a Gene Fout night. This, this uh, uh, poster actually is from an earlier Gene Fout night. Jim showed a picture of her receiving some gifts. Uh, so this is her second Gene Fout night on September 6th. They had a sense that she was not going to return. Uh, they wanted to honor her. Unfortunately, she ends her career by losing three to nothing to the uh, Grand Rapids Chicks. Uh, but at the end of the year, she's named Player of the Year again. So that basically ends her career. What happens to her? Jim mentioned that um, a couple of times she tried to attend games, but it was so sad to her she cried during the games that she just simply could not watch them play while she wasn't on the field. So she left baseball completely. She had two sons, but she also afterwards became a professional bowler. And it was one of those credited with starting the Women's Bowling, Professional Bowling Association. Um, I asked her why. She said, well, you know, when you stop playing, that your competitive spirit isn't gone. You're going to compete in something. And so she bowled and she played golf. She was apparently a pretty good golfer. Uh, she stayed in South Bend, uh, worked at the University of Notre Dame. Um, interesting enough, in the department that did mosquito studies, she would tell you a story about how she was in charge of uh, keeping the stock, I guess you would call it, of mosquitoes. And there were people all over the world that would ask for a certain sort of mosquito. And I didn't know this about mosquitoes, but apparently you can keep them in some sort of stasis forever <coughs> and then add water and they'll come back alive. Okay? And so she would be responsible for shipping these out all over the world as they did malaria studies and that sort of thing. Uh, again, an example of somebody who came from a small town and used the opportunity to expand her horizons. And again, another picture of our book. We're not pushing that too much, I don't think. <laughs> okay. uh, and that's basically it. I had, to, I had fun. We, we, Jane and I went with Jean uh, to the reunion. And uh, like I said, it was just fun seeing those women uh, gather together. Sadly, there were more um, associates there than players. There were only like 46 or 47 players there. Uh, most of them have passed on. Uh, you know, like I say, the youngest are in their upper 70s. But we, Betsy Jock and a few others, only a few of those are left from the 1943 season. Okay, so that's it. Thank you.